Not everything in a given horror series needs to be a stone-cold classic. That being said, some series don't get their fair shake that they deserve. For example, there are some absolute bangers in the later entries of series like Puppet Master or Child's Play that are overlooked thanks to entries in, say, Leprechaun or Hellraiser that would make you swear off of sequels, be it direct-to-video or not. Some series, like the focus of today's entry, probably didn't need or deserve sequels, but that never stopped an executive from being greedy before. Silent Night, Deadly Night is an all-time classic for a reason, but what about its four, yes, four sequels. Part 3, also known as Better Watch Out, sits in an interesting place right in the middle of the series. It has the last plot threads of the first two movies, and I use the word plot very loosely, and the two after it decided to go the full insanity Halloween 3 route and have nothing to do with the series apart from the title space. Part 3 definitely has its flaws, but it still may be one of the best horror movies you never saw. Last December, I was torn between this entry and the Brian Yuzna helmed part 4, and went for the latter because its absurdity was like a car wreck that I just couldn't keep my eyes off of. While I don't regret that decision and hope that a ton of viewers added that to their naughty list, this year I wanted to spotlight part 3. While it's not quite as crazy, the cast and director make it an interesting piece, and the movie itself has a lot to offer. According to director Monty Hellman, the script was rewritten in a week and shooting and editing took no time at all. While this isn't exactly the hallmark of a great movie, at least it was an easy shoot for all involved. Hellman even mentioned that he thinks this is his best work, although the movie is admittedly not his best movie. You no good damn <laughs> I can't find anything on the recent Blu-ray release or online, but this screams of being created as a standalone project and then having Silent Night, Deadly Night being shoehorned in, much like a lot of the aforementioned Hellraiser movies that were created as one thing and then had a dash of Pinhead added to create its own sequel. The movie opens with a woman named Laura waking up in a hospital and being chased by a very Frankenstein's monster-looking Bill Mosley. I'm the one who beats you when you're fat. Who's your daddy? We know her name is Laura because this creature continues to whisper the name as he chases her. She runs into Santa Claus, who beckons her to sit on his lap. This must seem like a reasonable request as she begins running through her list of gifts before he brandishes a knife and she screams to wake her up. Yep, not that it didn't feel like it already, but this was a dream. We also learn that Laura is blind and being observed and treated by a Dr. Newberry. Laura then dreams of killings from the first movie in the series, and then we get shown that the man she dreamed of also exists in the waking world. Another clue that this may not have originally been meant for this series is the cut and pasted on patient info that tells us that he is actually Ricky Garbage Day Caldwell from the first two movies. Garbage Day! Ricky is played by Bill Mosley, and this is probably pretty low on the list of his horror roles that includes Chop Top from Texas Chainsaw 2 and, of course, Otis in the Rob Zombie Firefly trilogy. This man is a gem, and while he perhaps isn't on the same level as a Robert England or Kane Hodder, he's just as beloved as someone like Jeffrey Combs with nearly as many memorable roles. Laura is played by Samantha Scully, and this is one of only four credits for the actress. She definitely gets lost in the crowd here with other actors, but would have done well in the DTV horror realm. Dr. Newberry is played by the first of two Hollywood heavyweights to show up in this movie. Richard Bamer started in TV in the early 50s, but was also Tony in West Side Story, and eventually Benjamin Horn in the first run of Twin Peaks. Laura's dreams have woken up Ricky, who thankfully isn't a walking murder joke and played by a far better actor but the killing begins again. 
at least in her dreams. A drunken mall Santa wanders into the hospital, and that's what actually wakes Ricky up, who proceeds to kill both the Santa and the receptionist before walking out of the hospital in broad daylight. Laura's brother and his new girlfriend pick her up from a therapy session, and the girlfriend, Jerry, is played by Laura Herring, who is most famous for Mulholland Drive, as well as her multi-episode runs on soap operas Sunset Beach and General Hospital. The trio decides to head to their grandmother's house, but Ricky kills the driver who picked him up hitchhiking, as well as a gas station attendant who happens to be watching The Terror, a movie that Monty Hellman was an uncredited director on. Hellman was definitely an interesting selection for director on the project, but brings lots of interesting angles and shots. Hellman was one of the maverick directors of the 50s and 60s who started off on very low-budget affairs like Beast from Haunted Cave and Backdoor to Hell, but also certified cults like The Shooting, Tulane Blacktop, and China 9 Liberty 37. After this movie, he would go 17 years without directing anything, but from one maverick director to another, he would help produce Quentin Tarantino's Reservoir Dogs. Hellman would also get story credit along with Rex Weiner, with Rex getting the screenplay credit. Yes, I promise Rex Weiner is a real dude. He also wrote the screenplay for the Andrew Dice Clay vehicle, The Adventures of Ford Fairlane. Ricky beats the group to Grandma's house, and she is just too nice and lets him in with little regard for her own safety. Just when the movie starts to drag on, it introduces its main police officer character in Lieutenant Connolly. Instead of a no-name here, however, we get a damn legend in Robert Culp. Culp had 176 credits and was all over the place from TV shows like The Greatest American Hero and I Spy to movies like The Pelican Brief and Hanny Colder. He even showed up in the all-time classic video game Half-Life 2 as Dr. Breen. Also, since I don't know when else I'll be able to mention it, he's also in the way too creepy TV movie with Eli Wallach, A Cold Night's Death from 1973. Culp plays the cop with zest and more fun than everyone else has in the entire movie combined, and he really elevates the whole project. Connolly knows who Ricky was and is shocked that he's still alive. Laura can see and know what Ricky does, but due to their link, he can too. Laura's brother Chris and Jerry look for Granny, but they come up with nothing and then find out that their car is missing. Laura senses Ricky, but they don't find him while Connolly continues to find the trail of bodies that will lead them to our group with the good doctor. Ricky makes his presence known by breaking through a door with his hands to choke Jerry. <laughs> Holy shit! They find a shotgun and attempt to escape, but Ricky finds them and kills Chris. Mosley's performance is so different than the first two killers in the series. Billy is a damaged psychopath who snaps and yet you still feel some sort of pathos for, while Ricky in part two is maybe the strangest and most laughable villain, unintentionally or not, in any slasher film ever. Here, Bill plays him with quiet rage and even an affable kindness at times, where maybe he doesn't know what he's doing is wrong or doesn't want to kill. The doc shows up in the car he stole from Connolly and tries to talk Ricky down, to try and understand him. Ricky doesn't want to be understood, however, and the base impulses of his damaged brain take over in pursuit of Laura. He kills the overly confident doctor and goes after the girls. While the first three movies of this series could constitute as slasher films, this one does it the best, primarily due to Mosley's performance. The lights go out and Laura finds Jerry's corpse before confronting Ricky. He thinks maybe she understands him, but when she screams and runs away, he goes overboard in his chase for her. She finds Granny's body and a voice tells her to use her power to even the odds. She turns off all the lights to try and make it even in a wait until dark situation. She's able to fight off Ricky as Connolly and the backup arrive. They take her away and she wishes the lieutenant a Merry Christmas, followed by Ricky wishing the audience a Happy New Year. It's not really a twist ending as he's almost ethereal. I see it as his spirit is finally at peace. The movie did very well in the direct-to-video market and did play some festivals, but never got a wide or even limited theatrical release. It wraps up the trilogy in a unique way, and while it's a tad slow, it's different enough from the first two that it makes for a worthwhile viewing, especially if you marathon the movies together. 
For a while, it was only released on poor quality DVDs with other middling movies at the time, but in 2022, Vestron Video released it on a triple pack Blu-ray with parts 4 and 5. Special features were included, and it's just nice to be able to have the entire series on physical and in high def. If you don't want to take a chance on a blind buy, it's usually on Tubi for streaming. Grab some hot cocoa and move this from your naughty list to the nice list of best holiday horror movies you never saw.